Welcome to Shooting Straight with Brad and David. I'm Brad Carline, your Navajo County Attorney, and my partner is... David Klaus, your Navajo County Sheriff. And our guest this month is DPS Commander Jeff Sharp. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Glad to be here. Jeff, thank, thank you. Thank you. So, Jeff, you're the new commander of the Northeast Arizona area of DPS. What exactly does that entail? Yes, sir. I'm the district commander for all of Navajo and Apache County. And my responsibility is to supervise the sergeants and troopers um, across both counties, which is six squads with six sergeants. So exactly what does supervise them mean? Are you scheduling them or, or is it much more than that? The sergeants are primarily responsible for the scheduling. What I oversee is the everyday activities, um, you know, a lot of the calls that we respond to, making sure that, that gets passed down to our headquarters down in Phoenix, and uh, just to make sure the daily operations are running smooth. So what are the responsibilities of the patrol troopers for DPS? The pol patrol troopers' um, primary responsibilities are to enforce the traffic laws that commonly lead to collisions, sometimes serious and fatal. Um, obviously those being speed, distracted driving, impaired driving, and the one that we're really always trying to push are the seat belts. One of the new laws is this distracted driving that you just talked about that was passed this year. Can you help explain to people exactly what they can and can't do so they don't get in trouble? Yes, the new statute that was just passed is 28914, and it refers to any wireless device that's being used during operation in a motor vehicle. Now being used means in the hands. What we want are hand-free devices to replace that phone being in the hand so that people can focus on the road, keep two hands on the wheel. Um, that was just passed through this last legislation. Now what they've done is given a grace period until 2021. So all we're doing is writing warnings for that violation itself, um, which is great because, um, you know, there's a lot of people we stop that may not have heard of it or may think it refers to texting only. Um, but anytime that device is in your hand, that's the law that we're trying to enforce. So can you still use your cell phone as you're driving if you're using, say, like the Bluetooth capabilities and giving it directions orally? Yes, sir, and that's what we prefer. Um, the new vehicles most all have Bluetooth now, and there are other alternatives to uh, cell phones to making it a hands-free device. Um, that's what's required. The only exception is if you're at a stoplight or a stop sign for that short time if you need to check. But otherwise, while a vehicle's moving, you have to be hands-free of that device. So it's all right for a uh, motorist to pull over to the side of the road as long as they're not in traffic and use their cell phone or pull off? Yes, sir, as long as that vehicle stopped. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, I have a couple interesting questions to kind of change topics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people, they often confuse sometimes the sheriff or DPS mm -hmm. or police departments. Um, could you kind of explain, um, I often get questions, where does DPS have authority or can they stop me inside city limits or can they right. only stop me on a state highway and not a county highway? Can you kind of explain some of those right. things? That's a good question. Um, for years we've been the Department of Public Safety. That's the state police agency. Uh, within DPS there are five different divisions with one of those being the Highway Patrol Division. So for years we've been known as the Highway Patrol. That was the white cars with the blue markings and the blue star. Well recently um, we've decided to rebrand and become state troopers. So now you may see a vehicle that says state trooper that's black and silver compared to Highway Patrol. Still the same job, um, still the same troopers, um, just a rebranding. So as far as DPS, our primary responsibility are the highways, the state highways, the interstates. But we do have jurisdiction statewide, so there are times we may be off the highway enforcing laws um, on the county roads, you know, and a big part of that is assisting um, the city and county agencies with, you know, whatever we may be able to. Yeah, so um, can, uh, a question I often get is, can you um, arrest somebody or can you investigate, um, say, a theft at a Circle K if there's no police officer or deputy available? Yes, we can. Um, there are some things um, we're able to enforce those. 
but as in we like to say we're experts in the DUIs and collision reinstruction. Other agencies are sometimes experts with the domestic violence and theft, so sometimes we'll lean on uh, the other agency to investigate those, but we are capable of doing those and sometimes do. Yeah, and much more so I would say in Navajo and Apache counties versus you would see in Phoenix metro area where you see a trooper or a DPS officer hand in hand with a county deputy or a city police officer. Right. Um, and that's where I think a lot of people get those questions and you and I and uh, one of my deputies and one of your officers hold the exact same uh, certification or mm -hmm. uh, authority from the state as Arizona peace officers. Right. And um, so you see see that more here versus what you would see in uh, Phoenix working together uh, hand in hand investigating different crimes. Right. And I'll tell you that's what I was really excited to have the opportunity to come up here. Um, I was a state trooper in Minnesota for 10 years and worked small town. And the opportunity to come up here and work small town again. A large part of that is being able to work with our partners, um, watching the troopers and, and the deputies and the officers work together. Really enjoy that aspect of this job. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you mentioned it. Tell us a little more about your career with DPS, where you've worked, and kind of the different assignments you've held. Okay. I was a Minnesota trooper for 10 years. Um, while I was a Minnesota trooper, had the opportunity to spend four years as a task force officer with the Drug Enforcement Administration and was also able to uh, work a canine dog for three years. Um, came back to Arizona and been a, with DPS now for 17 years. While with DPS, my job primarily kept me down in the valley. Um, I worked highway patrol and metro, promoted to sergeant with a metro squad, and then went to internal affairs. So I worked internal affairs for four years, uh, spent one year as the supervisor at our Armory, which is at Ben Avery facility down in Phoenix, and then promoted to captain. And when I promoted to captain, we were discussing earlier during my promotion was in the middle of the Red for Ed down at the Capitol. So that was my introduction to being a captain. I uh, was down at the Capitol for one year, and as Captain Phelps was retiring, started to notice there wasn't a lot of interest in his position. So uh, excited about the opportunity, glad that I've got it, and uh, enjoy hunting and fishing which had nothing to do with <laughs> me wanting to come up here but I'm very glad to be up here. You're in closer proximity for it now. Much easier. <laughs> Much Tell easier. us a little bit about the Capitol. I know people find that interesting when um, I, Brad and I both know what DPS does at the Capitol but a lot of people probably say what's a highway patrolman doing at the Capitol? Right. A few years ago, probably about five years ago now, uh, there used to be a separate Capitol Police. Well, the Capitol Police was absorbed by DPS, with it being the state capital, just easier to absorb them and make them part of DPS. So we have troopers now working the Capitol. There's approximately 58 buildings down there. When you think of the Capitol, it's not just the governor's office. Uh, there are 58 buildings down at the Capitol with several different agencies within those buildings. So as the troopers down there, it's more like working a police agency rather than the state troopers. Um, different types of calls, but we were very active with the protests, the demonstrations that would come down there. Uh, it was a big eye opener for me because, you know, you're, you're interacting with the politicians, uh, met some great people down there, but you also have different groups from each side coming down there to protest, sometimes at the same time. So. Our primary responsibility is to cover those protests and demonstrations while realizing that everybody has their First Amendment rights. And we had to be very careful with that. Um, set any political beliefs aside and make sure that everything went smooth down there and everybody was able to voice their opinion as long as it didn't become you know, something that could cause a riot. So your primary responsibility is to keep the peace. Yes. Yes. Because there's a lot of active act, um, activities going on, a lot of citizens and a lot of right. um, political issues and your right. job is to make sure everyone can do, do what they need but do it safely. Right. Especially these days, you know, with a political divide which, you know, again, you recognize everybody has the right to voice their opinions and respect that. Um, there were a couple times though that, you know, people are so passionate about their beliefs that things would get out of hand and 
Uh, fortunately, I think at least down at the Capitol, we were able to resolve those without any serious issues. So how long did you hold that position at the Capitol? I was down there for one year. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was and enough. <laughs> it was a good year. <laughs> You learned a lot, I'm sure. I did. I did. It met a lot of great people. I really enjoyed the assignment. But again, um, Highway Patrol and working with the troops and with the other agencies has always been where my heart is. Um, so very excited to be up here. You said there were five different divisions within DPS with the state troopers or Highway Patrol being one. Mm -hmm. What are the other four? The other four starts with the director's office. Um, the director's office also has the uh, PIO, the media relations people, and internal affairs. There's the agency support division. Um, they're the ones that put on the training for the troops across the state and to see get a glimpse of how that works and the responsibility that they have. It's amazing the work that they do down there. And I'll say the same thing, the, the next division is the uh, TSD, Technical Support Division. They're responsible for all the technology, the computers, the radios, uh, the radio towers, making sure that we can all communicate properly. Um, I know there are so many other things that they do, but uh, the talent that's down there to keep these things running is amazing. Um, obviously the Highway Patrol Division that we, we talked about and then there's the Criminal Investigations Division. Um, within CI we have you know narcotics, get them, um, the gang enforcement, um, border strike force, um, a lot of small entities within CI. And as the commander up here do you have any supervisor responsibility over like the gang task force or the the drug teams that work in your two counties? No sir, not directly. Um, what we do is they have another commander responsible for them. Now obviously with it being in the same community we're always in communication with each, with each other, sharing information, um, but there's another commander responsible for the CI part of it. Now there's another interesting division probably under criminal investigations that we use their services a lot and that's the crime labs. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about more about the crime labs you guys operate or? Sure, yeah the crime lab. We have one uh, lab in uh, Flagstaff, Phoenix, Tucson and I believe there's another one out um, near Kingman. Um, but all the evidence that we get, whether drug analysis, blood, any other substance, we can send to that lab for analysis to see exactly what it is we're and dealing with. it's not with. just DPS, it's every agency in the state. Because right. I know all the law enforcement agencies in Navajo County utilizes the DPS crime lab. Right. And we will, uh, you know, my main office is in Holbrook, and we have evidence custodians up there that will oftentimes gather evidence um, from the counties and from the police agencies, um, gather them in Holbrook, and then transport those to Flagstaff for, for the analysis. And go ahead. No, I was going to say, it's in one of the most uh, recent things that just amazes me is, uh, which you may have heard about, is the rapid DNA. Um, it's somewhat new now, I want to say uh, three or four years, maybe a bit longer. But now the ability to gather DNA and have a result back within hours rather than weeks or sometimes even months, months. is amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, and that's like Brad was mentioning, that's a service that we at the Sheriff's Office use. Um, there's large agencies like Phoenix, um, Mesa, Glendale, they'll have their own labs, mm -hmm. but small rural agencies, every agency in Navajo County uses the state labs. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily true for every agency throughout the state except for the five okay. large ones are, right. right and um, that's a that's another way that we work together and that mm -hmm. we use those services to help you know further criminal justice here right so back in Minnesota you talked about being undercover and mm -hmm. doing the DA task force how come your career never went more that direction and you kept being drawn back to the highway patrol side you know when I I left Minnesota um, I was done with um, the DEA part, and Minnesota was a great place, great people. Um, they were strictly highway patrol, um, enforcing you know, traffic laws until you're 55 and able to retire. So it's not like DPS where you have the different entities within it that you can transfer to. Um, in Minnesota, a lot of the criminal investigation part is turned over to the BCA, or the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Which is a different entity It's in a Minnesota. different agency to where if we had a big criminal case, 
then the BCA would take that over. Is that a state agency? Yes, yes. Whereas here at DPS, we have those entities within DPS. So when I was done with the DEA task force, um, wanted to continue with the narcotics investigations. Uh, came down to Arizona to do that, and when I got hired on with Arizona, things kind of went stale for a while as far as transfers. So I was sent back to Highway Patrol, which uh, no complaints whatsoever. I absolutely love it. Um, it was just a different path, and it worked out very well. I love being out, meeting the community, and also now and then getting the little adrenaline rush that <laughs> other things sometimes bring. But uh, 27 years, and it's it has been a great career. So as a, a commander, captain, do you still get the opportunity to make stops yourself or participate in things that are going on as a backup or something else? I do, and at least for me, I think that's important, and I think it's a little different for the troops. I had to explain to them that if I show up on your scene, it's not because I'm checking up on you. I just like being involved. Um, I will go out and work some of the DUI details that we have. I will make traffic stops. I still enjoy doing that. Um, as long as I can still balance getting my primary responsibilities done, I will be out there yeah, meeting the public. I enjoy doing that. So I was going to ask you, when you went to Highway Patrol in Phoenix, were you on a freeway squad or down there working the interstate and stuff? I was. What we, re we refer to as the ditch, I-17 and I-10, yes. So tell me it some is. of the, the, difference, the differences between working the ditch versus a trooper working 260 or 77 mm -hmm. here in Navajo County. I would say the biggest difference is uh, the troopers work in downtown Phoenix a large part of their responsibilities are reactive. There are so many collisions and calls that happen down in the Phoenix metro area that they are continuously running to these different calls. Whereas in outlying areas, you have to be more proactive. You have to go out and initiate those contacts rather than you know, listening to the radio and responding to all the calls. That's probably the biggest difference that I see. So, since it's more proactive up in a rural area, what are you pushing down as a message to your troops as how to be proactive? Because I assume that your concepts might be slightly different than your predecessor and maybe others. You know, it all starts with, we discussed before, um, our primary goal is to reduce the violations that cause collisions, to try to save lives. Um, speed enforcement, um, impairment, always looking for impairment, whether it's alcohol or drugs, because obviously these days we're getting about the same number of drug impaired drivers as we are alcohol. So we're training more troopers on what to look for and we're really trying to to put an emphasis on the impaired driver through drugs. Um, and well, I said when you before, say drugs, you're talking about not only illegal drugs but also abuse of prescription medications? Yes, yes. Um, probably more so even the prescription medications. It's, you know, it's no secret that oxycodone and some of these other drugs have, have been in the news. Um, we do see a lot of that cause an impairment on the roads. Um, and there are things you can look for with a driver, and it's the same thing you know, with marijuana. You'll hear the old tale that you know, people smoke marijuana because they can't get caught. Well, we're sending troopers, uh, there have already been several, but we're sending more troopers to school to become a drug recognition expert. And there are things that we can look at with a driver that will help us, A, determine if they're under the influence of a drug, and B, we can also usually tell what category of drugs they're under the influence of. So we're stepping up the training in that. Um, and again, the seat belts. Can't tell you how many collisions we see where if somebody was wearing a seat belt, they may have been banged up a little bit, but they would have survived that crash. Whereas a vehicle that rolls over maybe once or twice, somebody's ejected and, and unfortunately, you know, die from their injuries. Um, we cannot, you know, we cannot push seatbelt enforcement enough. Yeah, you know, at the sheriff's office, we've been doing a big push, and I know the state has as well. Um, Memorial Day to Labor Day is often known as the 99 dangerous days of summer mm -hmm. for the highway safety or highway travel. And we've already been seeing it locali or locally in some of the collisions we've been investigating over these holiday weekends. And 
we, the, we can't stress it enough and there's not enough education you can put out there that people need to slow down, wear their seat belts and um, I appreciate working with you guys and helping uh, with these DUI enforcement activities we've been doing. Sure. Going back to the marijuana impairments, you hear from a lot of these advocates for it that there is no impairment. Mm -hmm. I, have you and your troopers found people that have used marijuana that there is a period of time where they may not be as good of a driver as they think they are? You know, I think we're getting into some of the statistical information that I don't have. Um, I know that we do stop several drivers who are under the influence of marijuana. Um, that time period from when it goes to ingestion to how long they're still going to be under the influence, I don't have that information. Um, but we are stopping several cars with drivers who are under the influence of marijuana. Are they weaving like someone on alcohol or not as consistent with speed or the same type of impairments that you see with alcohol or are they somewhat different? Um, you know, they're pretty consistent. Um, speeds may be lower than the posted speed limit or their reactions will be slower, especially when you're coming up behind them to stop them. You may be stopping them for something else, but when you hit your overhead lights, their response is delayed or them getting over to the right shoulder is delayed, and we start picking up on those things. So as we see those during the initial traffic stop and we, when we approach the driver, we'll start looking for a few other things just to make sure they may be unfamiliar with what to do when they get stopped or unfamiliar with the area, but we're also looking for the other side of that to make sure they're not impaired. I know from a prosecution side, you know, alcohol, we have the blood alcohol concentration we can get from blood or breath, mm -hmm. but we're still waiting for the scientific community to decide what level is impairment and how you measure it mm -hmm. on the marijuana side. Right. And that's why it's so important for us. Um, if we have a driver that we think is impaired, we'll ask them to, to perform field sobriety tests. And we'll have them come out and, and do some tests, and there are things that we look for within those tests. If a person takes those tests and they pass them, then great. If they take those tests and they don't pass them, then we have a, the uh, probable cause to arrest them for driving under the influence. So, yeah, those are some good tools that. Um, you, you talked about drug recognition and those field sobriety tests. I remember as early in my career it was very pushed on alcohol, which you could smell the odor. Mm -hmm. Now it's starting to look at things with field sobriety where you start looking for different clues or of impairment. Right. Which, and when you were mentioning that, I've seen that um, with our own deputies that we're seeing more and more arrests through drugs. Mm -hmm. where it's about 50-50 with alcohol, whereas before it was, this, it was much uh, differentiated in the scale. Right. But um, what, are some, uh, what are some other you know, things that the troopers are working on this summer to help with the highway safety as, as far as, I know you've done some um, sobriety checkpoints. I think mm -hmm. there's a couple more coming up. Yeah, we always, especially around the holiday time, um, the Governor's Office of Highway Safety, they've been very supportive of us uh, doing these details. So usually around the holidays, um, we'll initiate a DUI task force, or in some cases, as we did in Winslow um, over Memorial Weekend, set up a DUI checkpoint. And that's where we have a checkpoint at the roadside and we're bringing drivers through. We don't contact every driver, um, but we stop some drivers, disengage in conversation, make sure they're traveling safely, wearing their seat belts, and more importantly, not under the influence. Is um, there another checkpoint for August in South County? Yes, I know we have one coming up. I can't remember the dates. It might be for the Labor Day. It's Labor Day weekend, we're gonna set up a checkpoint. Um, and also the White Mountain DUI task force. Uh, you may have seen the van set up and working details there. Uh, we're going to start moving that around a little bit, getting out to Springerville and up to St. John's rather than just doing it here in the Shuttle Pine Top Lakeside area. So we're going to start traveling around a little bit and really just try to encourage people not to drive impaired. 
Well, we're about out of time. I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank sure. you. Sure. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this month's installment of Shooting Straight with Brad and David. And please stay tuned for this month's Most Wanted. The Navajo County Sheriff's Office is seeking Samari Leba, a white female, five foot tall, with brown hair and hazel eyes, wanted on a felony warrant for transportation of dangerous drugs for sale. If you have seen or know of the whereabouts of Samari, please call the Navajo County Sheriff's Office at 928-524-4050 or anonymously contact WeTip at 1-800-78-CRIME or at wetip.com.